Hey everyone, I'm Bob. I'm going to tell you about this uh, motion sequencing tool that we built. I'll tell you a little bit about how it works, tell you a little bit about what we've done with it, and I'll tell you very little about what we're thinking about doing with it in the future. All right, so the starting point of all of this is the fascination that all of us share with the behavior of animals in the natural world. Right? When animals are out in complex dynamic environments where they're kind of free to do what they want, when they want, they exhibit this kind of robust and rich set of behaviors that to us as, as humans you know, it's really inscrutable, but obviously has meaning for the animals. And a main goal of my laboratory is to understand how the brain imposes structure on this kind of natural behavior to afford it with meaning and with purpose. To that end, for the past several years, we've been developing telescopes that let us characterize uh, in the laboratory the spontaneous or naturalistic behavior of, of rodents. Um, <clears throat> we obviously, when you think about behavior, you have to measure something often, but not always, as you'll see at the end of my talk. Uh, we take advantage of depth cameras that are capable of seeing mice in 3D. So this is a mouse running around in a cheap bucket, and we're imaging it with a depth camera, and heat mapped over each pixel of this mouse is its height at any given point. So you can get a sense from this image, from this movie, that you know, we can really capture the three-dynamical pose dynamics these animals expressing in the setting. We then submit these data to um, our motion sequencing or MoSeq algorithm. Uh, I won't talk to you too much about how MoSeq actually works, but it's an unsupervised time series machine learning approach to decomposing behavior. It seeks to identify the optimal set of behavioral elements, or what we refer to as behavioral <coughs> syllables, out of which behavior is created by the brain in any given experiment. It, it learns in a given context uh, how many behavioral syllables there are in a typical open field experiment, this bucket experiment here. It'll discover 40 or 50 of them. Typically, they're three, four, five hundred 500 millisecond long, stereotype repeatedly used motifs of three-dimensional action, like a rear, a turn to the right, or a step to the left as shown here. So for a given experiment, MoSeq will tell us the identity of these guys, how many they are, and of course the order in which they occur, and that allows us to synthesize all of that information into a behavioral state map that effectively captures the moment-to-moment -moment behavioral choices that animals make as they confront the natural world. Here, each node is a behavioral syllable. Its diameter reflects how often that syllable is used in a particular experiment, and the yellow directional arrows capture the observed likelihood of transition over time, one to the other. So when the mouse does this thing, it's almost certain to, to, to do this thing next. So, so these kinds of behavioral state maps you know, do a really nice job of quantitatively encapsulating the overall behavioral comportment of any mouse in a given experiment. And that, of course, allows us to use this kind of approach to objectively think about how perturbations, genetic, optogenetic, and otherwise, you know, might affect behavior. And we and our collaborators have used this in a billion different ways. I won't take you through all of those. Again, 15 minutes. Uh, but I will show you just two examples to give you a flavor of kind of what's up. Um, so here uh, on the left is, a, is um, data that derives from an experiment in which we took 1,000 mice and we injected each mouse with one of like 30 different drugs at one of like five, six, seven doses. Um, and then we just did some motion sequencing on them. What you're looking at here is, of course, the confusion matrix on the y-axis are the drugs that were actually injected into these little beasts and on the x-axis um, are the drugs that our classifier believes that the animal was received, received based upon their behavior alone, and you know, to a first approximation, we have near, near perfect performance here. In other words, MoSeq is really great at, at disambiguating even subtly different uh, effects of drugs, which of course act as the nervous system to impact behavior. We really think of this as an experiment that queries the ability of, of MoSeq to capture overall behavioral variability, and from a quantitative perspective, it does a great job. Um, here's another couple on the right here, a, a couple of kind of thematically related results um, that I think are very interesting and highlight some of the strengths of motion sequencing. In this experiment, we took 16 female mice, uh, and every day for a month, we ran them, or six weeks, we ran them in the open field and did some motion sequencing. Uh, so we have a lot of data, okay, on, on 16 different individuals over time, and on each one of those days, we swabbed them to figure out which phase of the estrous cycle they were in. As you can see from this classifier, um, based on behavior alone, we can make no predictions about which phase of estrus they're in, which is consistent with the idea that the estrous cycle doesn't substantially impact open field behavior in C57 female mice. But what's really interesting here is that if you give me 10 minutes of any session from this whole month, I can with approximately 100% accuracy name the mouse that's generating the behavior. This reveals, I think, a startling and un, you know, previously underappreciated amount of inter-individual variability in mouse behavior that's stable across time and, and almost certainly sums to, to um, account for some substantial fraction of the overall behavioral variation we see in our experiments and you see in yours. So these are kind of phenomenological experiments that are meant to kind of show off mostly. Obviously, our main interest is in figuring out how um, the brain generates these syllables and sequences to allow animals to interact with the natural world. Uh, and so we've rendered with our collaborators motion sequencing compatible with all forms of neural recording. 
Uh, and we've decided, um, for a variety of reasons I don't have time to go into, to focus on specifically the role of the dorsolateral striatum in creating be behavioral sequences. For a, and that's for a variety of reasons. I, I don't have time to tell you, but we think of the dorsolateral striatum as kind of a key final common, common output sort of node that, that, um, that really plays a central role in deciding what animals do on a sub-second basis as they kind of exhibit spontaneous behavior. So to begin to think about that as a hypothesis, we have in this experiment implanted a miniscope in the dorsolateral striatum of the mouse, which allows us to do calcium imaging on populations of, of spiny projection neurons as we, and so we can record the 3D behavior of the mouse, as you see here. Here, this is a mouse that's aligned, so its nose is pointing to the right, and its tail is pointing to the left, although this mouse is, of course, running around in a circular open field. It's also obviously wearing this hat through which we're doing this calcium imaging over here. And you can see it's post hoc aligning these two data streams. And I won't take you through all the data here because that's not the point of this talk. I'll just say that it's clear from, from our analyses that the dorsolateral stratum contains with it, within it a systematic neural code uh, for three-dimensional mouse behavior such that it, at any given moment as animals switch from expressing one syllable to the next, a new neural ensemble is dialed in and that neural ensemble it, uh, it, the identity of the neurons in that neural ensemble and their activity allow us to predict which particular behavior the animal is expressing. If we do some other funny math, we can also um, use these neural data to understand something about the sequencing, the order in which syllables are unfolding over time. And if we lesion DLS, what we find is that um, all the syllables are expressed normally, but the order in which they occur is totally messed up. Um, and that has focused our attention on DLS um, it, it's clear that the dorsolateral striatum is playing an important role, in, at least in the rodent, assembling this kind of behavioral structure. Um, we've recently been wondering, you know, that, although it kind of focuses our attention on dorsolateral striatum, you know, it leaves important questions unanswered. Why, for example, are some syllables used more and others used less? What governs the ordering of these behavioral syllables? Uh, and that has recently got us thinking about the, the main neuromodulator that impacts the dorsolateral striatum, which is, of course, dopamine. So we've kind of repeated the, the thing I just showed you where we're recording from, prime, from neurons in dorsolateral striatum, except now we're going to record dopamine transients uh, by expressing uh, the dopamine reporter DLight 1.1 in the spiny projection neurons. And we can ask during spontaneous behavior how dopamine actually fluctuates in this region of the brain. And I'll remind you that obviously the conventional way of thinking about dopamine is that it's involved in learning and memory. It acts as a teaching signal. It responds to task structure and reward. And, and in this setting, there is no tax structure and there's certainly no reward. Nevertheless, when we do this experiment <coughs> and we post hoc you know, call syllables and we match that up to the fluctuations we're seeing in dopamine and dorsolateral striatum, we see all of these fluctuations in dopamine, right? a huge number of them, which I think is to some extent unexpected. Um, <coughs> and after a ton of analysis, what we can show is that, again, as animals transition from one syllable to the next, there's a little ping of dopamine. And it turns out the amplitude of that dopamine fluctuation seems to do a good job of predicting and, in fact, is causally involved in um, regulating how often a given syllable is used in the future. Uh, and so these dopamine fluctuations, even though they're occurring in the absence of a task or reward, seem to play an important role in predicting the ordering of behavioral syllables you know, going forward in time. Um, OK, so, so I, I just showed you these little examples very quickly to give you a sense of kind of where the technology stands uh, and the sorts of things we're interested in doing with it and, and, and what it's capable of. I think uh, um, and we, we've made this platform completely open and accessible to everyone. So we have classes. You go to the website online. There's videos. There's a Slack community. You know, six, seven times a year, we're, we're, we, we, host, we hold office hours. Uh, we've built up a community around this technology. Uh, so the, the question, I think, you know, for me and maybe for you is, you know, why isn't everyone in this room using this thing? And I think the main reason is that these depth cameras that see in 3D are super janky. So you know they're fragile. Uh, the, the, the data that comes out of them is very high. Is very has a lot of dimensionality, so that's really good. But they're they're practically a little bit low resolution. And the most important thing is that they don't play nice with obstructions. So you can't really use these kinds of cameras in really the kind of complex environments that you want if you want to think about natural behavior. That's been a main limitation. So what do you want to do? Right? What you want to do is to take advantage of what McKenzie has developed um, and, and think about feeding key points that are tracked, which are, of course, very flexible. And you can get from one camera or multiple cameras in all sorts of settings. Um, <clears throat> and you want to feed those to motion sequencing. Uh, and of course, we tried that, and that fails. Uh, and the reason why it fails is because of a feature of um, most forms of point tracking, which is that they're, you know, it's incredibly useful and accurate. 
But under adversarial circumstances, and this is a particularly adversarial example, if you watch, you'll see that there's a little bit of flicker to all the, the points, right? And, and there's always this flicker. There's actually some um, more recently developed um, versions of point tracking algorithms that are more context aware, and this flicker is still present even in those, other, those newer versions. Um, and the problem for us is that this flicker is misinterpreted by MoSeq as the initiation of a new syllable, right? MoSeq is an unsupervised technique that takes advantage of discontinuities in the data to identify when one syllable transitions to the next. So every time a point jumps here, MoSeq thinks it's a new syllable, which means that the output of MoSeq is garbage, okay? So in order, um, in order to address this, we've collaborated with McKenzie and others um, to think about incorporating the notion of key points directly into MoSeq. So Caleb Weinreb, uh, a postdoc in my lab, has done it successfully and has built what we call um, key point MoSeq. And, and it's a method through which you can, it's kind of conceptually, you can think of the key points as being smoothed based upon the premise the key points are going to participate in behavioral syllables that have some predictable structure that evolves over time. And if we do this, then the key points get smoothed out really nicely. This all gets denoised, and now we can perform key point MoSeq. We can take key points, we can feed them to MoSeq and identify syllables. So to, to really test this as an approach, we've built a panopticon. So you can just think of it as a clear plastic box with 620 hertz basilars from each possible axis and two depth cameras. That lets us think about how, if we feed different types of data of different dimensionality to mostly, how things change. And so if we just do the typical thing, which is to feed a single camera's worth of data, we can do two, 2D MoSeq very effectively. Uh, I told you before, for depth data, we typically learn 50 syllables or so with a single camera from above. In this setting, if you have a single 2D camera, we learn about 25 syllables, okay? If you have a 3D, if you have to take advantage of all six cameras to get 3D key points, um, we, we end up getting about 37 different syllables. And again, if you have depth data, you get about 50. And so as the dimensionality of the data you feed MoSeq increases, the number of syllables you learn increases, which makes a lot of sense, right? The thing you're calling is, is behavior, right? So you can just see here, I, I can find it. Like here, there's a rearing syllable in 2D that, that is just one thing, but this rearing syllable gets broken up into two things. Uh, when, once you have access to 3D data, you know that sometimes animals rear up this much, other times they rear up this much, and, and that's, that's broken up by the, the increase in dimensionality. The critical point here is that although the number of syllables evolves as the data dimensionality increases, the temporal boundaries between the syllables don't change. Okay, so if we look at the ethogram from any of these data streams, from 2D, from 3D, or from depth camera, it always looks the same. And I, I mentioned at the beginning that, you know, motion sequencing is a time series method for, a, in an unsupervised way, identifying behavioral motifs. It really cares about the boundaries between behavioral elements. And that has allowed us to look at neurobehavioral relationships by using these boundaries as timestamps. Um, and this also allows us effectively to compare the performance of MoSeq to other unsupervised methods for characterizing behavior. I won't describe to them, them to you in any great detail. I'll just, I'll just I kind of show you a little bit of the data to give you a flavor. So here on the y-axis is actually time. Time zero is the moment at which a mouse will switch from expressing one syllable to the next. And y-axis is just going to be dopamine signal okay, from our dopamine data. And as I told you, there's this nice fluctuation in dopamine that accompanies the transition from one behavioral syllable to the next. And that's seen in this 3D data from our depth cameras. If we take advantage of a single 2D camera from above, we recover exactly the same neurobehavioral relationship. But if we use other more clustering types of, of methods like these sort of vein that don't really think about time in the same way that MoSeq does, we lose this neurobehavioral relationship. Okay? And so that suggests that, that MoSeq is really, really useful if you want to think about how the brain actually generates spontaneous or natural behavior. Finally, I just want to mention that we've made this super duper easy to use. Uh, I just want to give you an example. Um, we shared this with my buddy, Bishop du Subor at Columbia, and uh, he works in naked mole rats. And so a week later, he came back with these videos. Um, these are what we call crowd videos. Each one of these big panels is an individual behavioral syllable. Uh, and each little sub-panel is an instance of that behavioral syllable. So you're looking at four naked mole rat syllables. Um, and you can see that when the dot comes over the animal, that's when the animal's expressing that syllable. And you can see here's a kind of run and turn. Here's some grooming, right? Here's the animal backing up. You know, and, and this, without any real tuning or anything, and this is, of course, a, a rodent that we didn't plan on you know, analyzing with MoSeq, it just works kind of out of the box. And so this is, a, this is a kind of robust technology that I think all of you can take advantage of, and it's freely available, and you guys should just go crazy. Uh, I'll just end by saying that uh, the, the work on Keypoint MoSeq was, was done, which is posted in the archive, um, with, with Caleb Weiner, who's the main person involved. And there are a bunch of other people who are involved in the behavioral analysis. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Mm-hmm. 
then there is like a labeling phase where the user needs to say, okay, these meet three rings, these right. like dark rings, right? That's right. Yeah, th that's true. You know, because um, this technology is being more and more used, and because we're distributing it, yeah. uh, in the current distributed versions of MoSeq, there is a way that we've built in code that allows you essentially to take advantage of a reference database of syllables that's fixed at 100 that we've labeled. And so like basically, you know, we have petabytes of this kind of data. And so like we've looked at these syllables a lot and, you know, poor undergraduates have labeled them. And so we have a kind of reference set. So the upside of that is that you don't have to, you can just take advantage of that reference set. You don't have to learn the syllables anew. You can just take advantage of our open field data set. The disadvantage is, of course, if the mouse is moved to a, a setting in which you know, the, the physics are different, the environment's different, if the genetics are different and does something weird, all that will be missed with that reference set. So this is a kind of common challenge with the unsupervised, this unsupervised methods. There's no way around it. We're doing our best to make it friendly. And I can imagine us hosting a variety of reference data sets in different settings that could be useful to people. When you classify these different syllables that you mentioned, did you find like some sort of hierarchical or clustering of those syllables? Yes, absolutely. So we, we see hierarchical clustering in multiple different ways. Okay. So the first is that you know, there are different forms of the same syllable. So we can actually perform hierarchical clustering, clustering over the syllables and the kinematics of the syllables themselves. And that kind of reveals essentially a map of behavior where rears are kind of all related to each other and grooming is all related to each other and there's some continuous evolution of, of the behavioral space. And when I, when I told you before that there's like a little mouse avatar in the mouse's brain, what I meant was that the neural um, ensembles that are activated by two different types of rear, you know, that are close together to each other in behavioral space. They're also close together to each other in neural space. And that, that kind of mapping holds true from this kind of behavioral space into the brain space. The, the other thing that's true is that if you look at the temporal expression of syllables, obviously, um, as an animal explores an, an open field, its behavior is decidedly non-stationary. And so like it goes through phases where it's, in the beginning it's really exploring a lot, then it kind of chills out into some other things, and at the end it gets bored. And while all that's happening, its internal states are fluctuating. Right? And what that, what that causes is kind of block structure in the transition matrix that kind of reflects the things that the mouse cares about in the moment. And, we're, and, and those blocks occur at longer time scales, not 300 milliseconds, but at five seconds to 10 seconds. And we're building hierarchical HMMs to really think about that longer time scale hierarchical temporal structure as well. Yeah, Ben? Have you tried this on types of behaviors that we kind of already think of as uh, sequential like speech, or we kind of already think of it as, you know, coding? Yeah, 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 that's a great question. So yes, we have. So we've done a lot of human facial video, which is naturally syllabic, so it's not a metaphor there, it's, it's a real thing. And it does, it does great. You know, the way that we typically classify human facial stuff, right, is essentially through kind of template matching to fixed templates for human faces that are associated with, say, emotions and things like that. That loses, that like throws out all this incredible dynamical information that is really useful for predicting kind of human behavior and what's going to, right. And so we've been taking the, exactly these kinds of methods and they, they, they play really nicely with behaviors that are naturally syllabic. Yeah, and we've also just in published work, we've used these approaches on, on, um, on mouse song. Uh, and in unpublished work, we've used, used it on, on bird song and it works very nicely. How do the syllables Yeah, again, so the dimensionality of the depth data, even if it's just a single camera, is, is higher than that for the key points. That, that should be intuitive. And so you get more syllables, and basically what you see is that individual syllables like a rear, which you would see as a single syllable from a single 2D camera, become kind of decomposed into multiple different types of rear as the dimensionality of the data in increases. And so, and, and so again, like the, the content of behavior seems richer as your data get richer, which makes perfect sense. But again, the important thing here is that the temporal boundaries between either a rich or a poor description of behavior are constant. And that allows you to use those boundaries as timestamps to think about how the brain is generating sequences or syllables. Yeah. Yeah, actually one of the great things about working with McKinsey to get Key Point MoSeq going is that now like social becomes trivial in, a, in the sense that like it's pretty easy now for us to, to, co to compute the syllables that are being expressed by you know, two or more animals all at once. 
Uh, and so obviously we're thinking about interdependencies there. I'll just mention one broad problem, okay, which is that you know, every machine that you've ever seen that thinks about mouse sociability, <coughs> thinks about mouse sociability through proximity. You and I are interacting at a distance. Okay, so like what we, what we really want are machines that somehow allow us to infer coupling with affordances and with other agents in the world, and that's a hard math problem. That's, that's harder than just like calling syllable for two different animals. And so that's the thing we're working hard at. We obviously can, can we've built a version of, of motion sequencing which we call SoSeq that allows us to discover, you know, social syllables where animals are clearly kind of proximal to each other. That's, I think, a not, that's, it's not surprising that we can do that. I, th I think the more interesting problem is the one about like, coupling with the world, and, and we're thinking hard about that. So with this, we're picking a single animal. Uh, is it just a single stream of behavior, or could there be multiple? Can, can a mouse walk and chew gum? Yeah, so we're actually, so this is really, yeah, this be, I'll answer this last question. The, um, so actually, we're working very hard on that exact question. So we, one of the things that we're aided by here is that it's clear to us that this rhythm where the animal's switching from syllable to syllable every 300 milliseconds isn't an artifact of the machine learning. If you just look at the data, it's present in the data. And if you look at neural data, it's present in the neural data. It's like a real thing. There's another faster rhythm that we know about that's real and it's incontrovertible, and that's the rate at which mice sniff. So, you know, the main, I, mean, I actually, half my lab studies will faction, and, and when mice are engaged with the world, they're sniffing at 8 to 12 hertz. And so it's clear that there's this, in, there, there are at least two fast interdigitated rhythms uh, that are happening. One that's like, which is walking and chewing gum effectively at the same time. And so we're thinking a lot about how we can understand the interrelationship between these two. The one thing I will say is that in response to our generous reviewers of this paper, this key point paper, they asked us to like to turn the time scale down so we can just look at sniff related things as opposed to whole body related things. And key point mostly kills that. It's great. So you can use the same tool to, uh, to look at multiple behavioral rhythms, and we're thinking about how to multiplex that information now. So thank you all for your attention.